Yes, basketball has changed. It's always been a great game, but now it has a new spirit. He dunks like Dr. J. He might be the new Ice Man. The modern day, Will Chamberlain. He looked like Magic Johnson. The future has arrived. You are watching what greatness is all about. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Vintage NBA. I'm Charlie Steiner, coming in off the bench this week in place of Robin Roberts. Now, today we're going to profile a player who forever changed the game of basketball, Elgin Baylor. It was Baylor who literally helped the game get off the ground during his 14 stellar seasons with the Lakers. Now, after his playing days, Elgin returned to L.A. as general manager of the Clippers. And in 1999, he drafted a young man who's become the cornerstone of the franchise, Lamar Odom. And this week, Lamar's in the chair talking about his boss, Elgin Baylor. The game was played like this until Elgin came and gave us this. The flavor of the game. The flavor of the game belongs to Elgin Baylor. Elgin just brought a flair to the game that um, a lot of players are, are not able to duplicate to this day. I first learned of his legacy when I got to the league. I've seen some footage on him. I was amazed at what I was seeing. Elgin was the first athletic basketball player. You know, in the 50s and the early 60s, there wasn't a player who, who, who played like Elgin. And speaking of all-around stars, here he is, perhaps the most complete player the game has ever seen. The Lakers captain, an all-pro every year since he's been in the league, Elgin Baylor. When you make a move that that takes a tremendous amount of body control and you get the ooze and ah from the crowd, you know, that's definitely going to feel good because not only are you a basketball player, you're also an entertainer. I'd like to show you some of the patented moves and some of the ad-lib moves of Baylor. He's got them all. It's no wonder they were so popular with the fans. Where would the game be today if, you know, if Elgin didn't bring the spin moves and the behind-the-back passes? We'll probably still be playing the, the real fundamental bob and weave, pick and roll type of game. He's around Jack and scores. What a brilliant play. Players like Elgin, you got to take a little bit from his game and kind of incorporate into your game. We are seeing a star born right here tonight. His name is Lamar Odom. He's real confident in his ability. He even thinks he could play in the game today and dominate. <laughs> I don't think my teammates really realize, you know, what he did for the game because we're, we're all so young. Hopefully one day Elgin can sit us down and play his grandpa role and just sit us to the side and really let those young guys know what he, what he did. Now obviously Lamar is much too young to have seen Elgin play. His childhood heroes were Larry Bird and Magic Johnson. But now he and Baylor have joined forces to try and make the Clippers a winner and maybe even eclipse their crosstown rivals, the Lakers. The glamour team in L.A. thanks in large part to Elgin himself. And we're going to take a look back at his Hall of Fame career in just a moment. This is the magnet that draws the fans into the new Los Angeles sports arena, now that big league professional basketball has reached the West Coast. Elgin Baylor, regarded by many as the best basketeer in the world. If you're a competitor, you, know, you like the idea of competing, but uh, going out with the feeling, knowing that, feeling, anyway, feeling that way, that one-on-one -on -one, nobody's going to stop you from scoring. The first time I saw him play, uh, I marveled. He used a lot of uh, body English, body language, and he put a lot of spin on the ball from both sides of the basket. 
There's Elgin going all the way. So he did a lot of things uh, with the ball that seemed like fun, a fun way to play the game. So where did Elgin Baylor come up with his first name? Elgin. Well, as it turns out, it was his father's favorite pocket watch. It's called an Elgin. It may have been an omen because in many ways, Elgin Baylor was way ahead of his time. He was one of the first of the NBA's truly flashy performers. He made spectacular plays long before they became a staple of nightly highlight reels. And when Baylor arrived in the NBA, no one had ever seen a player quite like him. He had what we call hang time. He used to, he used to look like he stayed there forever. Elgin was the first one to, you know, go up for the jump shot and hang up there for 15 seconds, had some, some lunch and a cup of coffee, and, you know, the defenders would all be back on the ground, and he'd finally decide to shoot the thing. Elgin Baylor was Michael Jordan before Michael Jordan. Baylor would, would just blow your socks off. You'd never seen anything like that before. Elgin Baylor arrived in the NBA in 1958 as the top draft choice of the Minneapolis Lakers. With his unprecedented blend of power and aerial artistry, he immediately took the league by storm. He was strong, he could drive past you. He hit the outside, shot pretty good. He was an outstanding passer. He was the type of a guy that if you had to play him, you said, let me let me off him. <laughs> okay. Another thing he had, uh, he had like a little tick, a little, a little uh, twitch, and that would kind of throw you off because you're on him, and they'd be twitching, and he, you'd, you'd kind of get a little nervous. Leaving defenders grasping for air, Elgin set a single-game NBA scoring record when he scored 71 points against the Knicks, and he quickly transformed them into perennial title contenders. This is the magnet that draws the fans into the new Los Angeles sports arena, now that big league professional basketball has reached the West Coast. Elgin Baylor, regarded by many as the best basketeer in the world. If you're a competitor, you know, you like the idea of competing, but uh, going on with the feeling, knowing that, feeling, anyway, feeling that way, that one-on-one -on -one, nobody's going to stop you from scoring. And he was never more unstoppable than in the 1962 finals when Baylor scored a finals record 61 points in game five against Boston. Up and over the greatest defensive player in the game, Bill Russell, a dunk shot. And I remember going after the game over to Tom Sanders, whose uh, responsibility had been inside of God Elgin, and saying, Satch, I think you did a hell of a defensive job tonight. You know, I mean, he, Elgin was that spectacular where he literally be became the first guy that couldn't be stopped. That season, Elgin and the Lakers took the Celtics to a decisive seventh game, and with the game tied, L.A. would have a chance to win the title with one final shot. Only three seconds left. Los Angeles has one last crack at the hoop. Selby misses the jump shot, and we go into a five-minute overtime with a score knotted 100 to 100. Boy, and that one shot, if that would have gone in, uh, it might have changed the course of history a little bit. But history was cruel to the Lakers, as they would lose not only that series, but five more times to the Celtics over the next seven years, each defeat more painful than the last. We just did not have anyone uh, to negate Bill Russell. It was just simple as that. Uh, and we could match him in other positions, but we just could not match him in the middle position. But with the addition of Wilt Chamberlain, the Lakers were heavily favored to win the 1969 Finals over an aging Celtics dynasty. And it seemed as if the 35-year-old Baylor would finally win a title. But in the seventh game, the series would be decided by an incredible twist of fate. Erickson, knocked away, but Nelson gets it. And the Boston Celtics have done it again. That's probably was the toughest one because we all felt that we had the best team. And they say the luck of the Irish, they won. And I think that was the toughest loss. I think that affected uh, the players that had been there all the years more than anyone. 
1972, the Lakers finally won their first championship in Los Angeles. But they had done it without Elgin Baylor. Age and injuries forced him to retire just nine games into that season. He left the game without that one prize that he had sought for so long. And, and I think the saddest thing about Elgin was that, no, he never won a championship. Came so close so many times. Despite his playoff frustration, Elgin Baylor still left an enduring legacy. He revolutionized the game and set the stage for the high-flying style of today's NBA. When you leave, you hope that you've left something, something that you will be remembered for. There were a lot of comparisons with Elgin Baylor, who I saw play many times on, on TV, and uh, patterned a lot of my um, uh, body movement uh, after. Modern basketball began with Elgin Baylor. When I say modern basketball, every single reverse layup, every single between the legs dribble, every single spinning move that you see in a routine manner in every single NBA game owes its existence to the mind of one man, Elgin Baylor. You know, Elgin might have won a string of scoring titles had it not been for the presence of one Will Chamberlain. For instance, Baylor averaged 38 points per game in 1962. That happened to be the year that Wilt averaged 50 while playing in Philadelphia. When Baylor retired, he was third on the all-time scoring list. He tried his hand at coaching for a time and then moved into the front office with the Clippers. We'll take a look at some other stars turned executives right after we take you back to Baylor's rookie season, 1959. At the 2000 NBA draft, no team was busier than the Los Angeles Clippers. Now, as we log on to NBA.com, we'll see that L.A. had three picks in the first round and acquired two others in a trade with Orlando. It was all the work of team vice president Elgin Baylor. Now, he's one of a number of players who went from making the shots to calling them in the front office. For instance, Elgin's former teammate, Jerry West, remained with the Lakers as GM once his playing days were done. He built the Showtime dynasty that won five NBA titles in the 80s and then built another championship team around Shaq and Kobe in 2000. Nick great Dave DeBusher also became an executive. As commissioner of the old ABA, he helped the league merge with the NBA in 1976. And as vice president of the Knicks, he single-handedly won the 1985 draft lottery that featured Patrick Ewing as the top prize. And these days, Michael Jordan is putting his leadership skills to the test as president of the Wizards. Michael's always loved to challenge, and that certainly is what he's got on his hands in Washington as he tries to build the Wizards into a winning team. Of course, there are other examples of stars who have found new careers as executives. Some stayed in their chosen fields, while others decided to try something a little bit different. For instance, General Dwight D. Eisenhower led American forces to victory in World War II. He was so popular that both parties tried to enlist him to run for president. He ran as a Republican in 1952 and was promptly elected to two terms. Politics always seemed to be in Bill Bradley's future, a Princeton graduate and a Rhodes Scholar. He was nicknamed Mr. President by his Nick teammates. Bradley, of course, hasn't gotten that far, at least not yet, but he did serve three terms as senator from New Jersey. Ron Howard gained fame as an actor playing Opie on The Andy Griffith Show and Richie Cunningham on Happy Days. But Ron then made the move to the other side of the camera as a director and has directed hit movies like Splash, Cocoon, and Apollo 13. As a member of the Beach Boys, Brian Wilson ushered in the surfing sound of the 60s. For a while, he rode the wave of hits, but then he stopped touring with the group. Wilson turned his talents to writing and producing. And in 1966, he produced the seminal album, Pet Sounds. And while Southern Californians were listening to the Beach Boys, local basketball fans were watching Elgin Baylor and the Lakers. The team moved into a new building in 1967, the Fabulous Forum. And with a look at some of the other modern arenas around the NBA, correspondent Chris Schenkel. The NBA plays in the best arenas throughout the country. This includes such places as Madison Square Garden, Detroit's Kobo Arena,
Baltimore's Civic Center. The Cincinnati Gardens. The Boston Garden. The Los Angeles Sports Arena and many others. The games attract growing numbers of fans from ocean to ocean, and you'll find many famous personalities in the crowds, ranging from TV star David Jansen and his wife. Doris Day. And Governor John Volpe of Massachusetts. From Boston to Baltimore, from New York to San Francisco, pro basketball gets a hand and a holler. So from the looks of it, the NBA really has a chance to catch on. And all the celebrities, even Doris Day, were on hand for the 1966 finals. It was the Lakers against the Celtics. And you'll see it in the Airwave archive when we come back. During Elgin Baylor's career, the Lakers made eight trips to the NBA Finals. Problem was, it kept running into the Celtics. Boston was the one mountain L.A. never could seem to climb. In 1966, the two rivals met once again. Boston led three games to one and looked to wrap it up in Game 5, which brings us to this week's Airwave Archive. In glorious black and white, here's Chris Schenkel and Bob Cousy at Boston Garden with L.A. trying to hang on in the final seconds. Have a two-point lead. Chris, don't think it doesn't take a little uh, intestinal fortitude on the part of uh, two officials who have done a tremendous job today. To call a foul like that in front of 13909 partisan fans. This entire series, incidentally, has been handled extremely well by these officials. There's been a minimum of complaining on uh, the part of either the Lakers or the Celtics, which normally is an indication that a good job is being done if you don't know the uh, officials are working. Scored the field goal and put the Lakers back in the lead is at the foul line. He is nine for nine from the foul line, and Casey Jones, who just came in the lineup, has called for a timeout. And on the clock, it appears, Bob, that we have about 10 seconds left in this ball game, with the Lakers leading by 419 to 115. Two, three, or four seconds remaining in the ball game. The Lakers leading by two points as a dejected red R back. And it appears uh, about pretty much that he's going to have to wait to light a victory cigar at least till Tuesday and maybe back here again in Boston. Exactly, uh, Chris. I'm sure at this point he's much more concerned about ever lighting that victory cigar. In other words, uh, the Lakers have once again displayed what a fighting team they are coming from behind twice in this game and now it looks like they definitely will go back Tuesday and if they can tie it up why anything can happen in one ball game so I'm certain that Arnold is much more concerned about uh, winning the world's championship than he is about where uh, he'd like to win it at one time these Lakers who deserve the utmost in credit led by 17 points they saw that lead go and with the Celtics by eight they have come back, as Bob has told you, and here are the reserves. We're looking at Gene Wiley, some of the others on the bench, Bob Boozer. They've been watching great interest out here. As we now have Rudy LaRusso at the foul line. And he puts the Lakers in front by three points. Only seconds remaining in this ball game. Weston LaRusso in the last seconds of the game, and there is the gun. And Earl Strom, it was not the gun. There is time still remaining, as the Boston Celtics have taken time out, but the Los Angeles Lakers lead by four points, as you see. There's actually a fraction of a second left, because...
And of course, with our one of our clocks indicating the 24 second or enforcing the 24 second rule being not a operative and using the stopwatch, we have no other indication other than the regular clock, which overhangs and also is in the front of the lower facade here at Boston Garden. We hope you've enjoyed this ball game. It's been a thriller here at courtside. 121 to 117. Only seconds remaining as the Lakers have shown the great team effort here this afternoon, coached by Freddie Schaus. You know, as Red Auerbach has indicated, doesn't have stars, just a great team unit. And, of course, the Lakers have a victory. And that makes it 3-2 to two in the best of seven series. It's a great win for Los Angeles. Once again, the final score, Los Angeles 121, Boston 117. Now, that game may have been in black and white, but we did want to show you what Elgin's jersey actually looked like. We have this replica of the old Lakers blue and white jerseys from the early 60s. They gave way to the late 60s familiar purple and gold uniforms. By the way, the Lakers did win game six of the 66 finals, but they lost game seven. As we head to a break, something else for you to ponder about the year 1966. All-Star Games of the 60s had at least one thing in common. Every one of them featured Elgin Baylor. Elgin was an 11-time All-Star. And right now, we're going to look back at one of his final appearances from 1969 in Baltimore. The announcer for the game, Chris Schenkel, making yet another appearance, along with his partner, Jack Twyman. And it's all in living color in this installment of the Airwave Archive. Back again at Civic Center in the NBA All-Star Game. The East leading by seven points, 60 to 53, as we await the start of the second half, and it should be a thriller. In that first half, Oscar Robertson and Earl Monroe were the leading scorers with 10 points each for the East. And there you see the statistics. Lucas and Cunningham with eight. Moving on down, the entire roster of 12 All-Stars representing the Eastern Division of the NBA. While for the Western All-Stars, Len Wilkins with eight, and several men with six, as you see, going on down the line. Twice, the West trail by only six points. But as we start the second half, it is 60 to 53, and in the center circle, a scene that we have uh, seen so often now being duplicated on the right, Will Chamberlain, and on the left, Bill Russell, two phenomenal basketball players. And I think the reason Chamberlain is starting, because of his strong showing in the second quarter, he has given this West team the momentum here. He's been a tower of strength on the boards, and they're going to try and continue through the third quarter what they started in the second quarter. Jeff Mullins of Duke University, who was a spark plug in the second quarter for the West, has his shot rebounded by Baylor. Baylor down in the corner to Chamberlain. Chamberlain outside to Elgin Baylor. And what a lineup for the West as the second half is now underway. Lou Hudson, Jeff Mullins, Will Chamberlain, Elgin Baylor, and Joe Caldwell. Here's Earl Monroe, the Baltimore Bullets, driving around a uh, Lucas screen, a hook shot up, and rebound. Bill Russell fighting for it, but it's Lou Hudson that takes it away. Long pass down the corner, and Joe Caldwell, too hot to handle. And there you see the fast break on the part of the West that we've seen so much in the second quarter. The fast break by the West. They've been running. They've forced the game to the East, and as a result, they've brought it to within five. Havlicek, Russell, Lucas, Robertson. There's Havlicek and Monroe. For the Eastern All-Stars, as Will Chamberlain comes up with another rebound. Turnovers. The East has ten. The West, eleven. Jeff Mullins to Caldwell. And now the West is within three points of the Eastern All-Stars, who had a big lead of 16 points at the end of the first quarter, 35 to 19. And the West putting a little pressure on the East, forcing Monroe and Robertson to set up the offense out a little further than they normally would. Live and in color from Baltimore, Maryland, the Bullets, Monroe. Baylor on the rebound, the Los Angeles Lakers star. Look at him move, trying to get past Jerry Lucas. 
Gives out to Chamberlain at the foul line. This is Jeff Mullins in the corner to Lou Hudson. Robertson defensively for the East. And Robertson is called for holding. There's Lou Hudson going on Oscar Robertson. There you see the foul by Oscar. He reached in and grabbed him. And Lou Hudson fouled. Watch out. Lou Hudson is at the foul line. And now it is 60 to 58. The West is within two points. The West, the underdog. And the East, Oscar Robertson is fouled by Jeff Mullins. Mullins now has two fouls as Oscar Robertson, appearing in his ninth All-Star game, goes to the line. The West is almost completely relying on Will Chamberlain to get the rebounds with uh, Lou Hudson and Joe Caldwell and Elgin Baylor. They're starting that fast break early. Wilt is getting the ball and getting it out. As a result, the West making a strong comeback here. Elgin Baylor driving on Jerry Lucas. Outside to Will Chamberlain to Caldwell. Guarded by Monroe. This is number 23, Lou Hudson. 22 is Baylor. A basket counts. Basket counts. Let's watch it again. There you see the great body control of Elgin Baylor driving on Bill Russell, using the body and extending the arm for the basket. That is what has made Elgin Baylor the great forward he has been for the past 10 years, Chris. And now he can tie the ball game up. He does. 61 all with 10 minutes and 4 seconds remaining in the third quarter. Live in color from Baltimore. Now that is the fourth time that the game has been tied. Three times in the first quarter, early. At 2 2 4 4 6 6. Now it's 61 to 61. And you see the defensive play on the part of Wood. Power strength on the boards, but he's been picking up men, cutting through, and guarding Bill Russell very closely. Havlicek and Russell. Chamberlain on the defensive board. Havlicek. 63 61. Joe Caldwell from Arizona State, member of the Atlanta Hawks, stolen by Havlicek, and Ohio State star hits the deck. Foul call. One of the West All-Stars unable to play in this game. We hope he's enjoying our telecast. Jerry West, the great star of the Los Angeles Lakers, sustaining a groin injury, unable to play in this game, replaced by Gail Goodrich and the Phoenix Suns. That's John Havlicek's eighth point in this ball game. The West on the attack. They're trailing by three points now. The Blue Devil misses the shot. Here's Bill Russell now of San Francisco, giving to Havlicek of Ohio State. And what a beautiful fake he put on Lou Hudson. However, offensive foul on an offensive Lucas. foul on Jerry Lucas, and that is his third personal. 9.21 remaining in the third period. Elgin Baylor, Hudson, beautiful. 64-63. The leader in assists thus far in the ball game is Lynn Wilkins of the West with five. Here's Oscar Robertson. Joe Caldwell from Will Chamberlain. Will on those boards, looking down the floor, and the West sending all four men down on the fast break. And Joe Caldwell on that play, getting the layup. And now the West is in the lead for the first time by one, 65 to 64, with 8:42 remaining in the third quarter. Jack trailing by 16, they have come on strong. A great comeback, and there you see Will Chamberlain, number 13, who has led the way for the West. Russell to Jerry Lucas. Chamberlain on the rebound, number 13. That is seven rebounds for both of the Lakers. Joe Caldwell to Lou Hudson, guarded by Earl Monroe. 67-64. A little mismatch there on the part of the West. Lou Hudson getting the smaller Earl Monroe on the side and taking advantage of the height and putting it up and in over Earl Monroe. Oscar Robertson. He's still battling under the board as Hal Greer gets ready to come in along with Willis Reed of the New York Knickerbockers. There's Elgin Baylor, number 22. Joe Gashu, Norm Drucker are the officials of this game. There's 15, Hal Greer of Marshall University and Willis Reed of Grambling College into the lineup for the East. And Will Chamberlain has not had to worry about Bill Russell's outside shot and as a result has been able to stay inside, clogging up the middle on defense, but more importantly, being in there for the rebound. What? Marshall outside weave now as Oscar Robertson goes around to Hal Greer pick. Chamberlain and Russell battling along with Havlicek. And 
Quilt sort of toying with uh, the opposition and getting the ball over to Joe Caldwell. The West leading 67 64. About seven and a half minutes left in the third quarter. Ooh, Greer on a steal. For the East, it's Hal Greer. Willis Reed of the Knickerbockers. Russell and Havlicek of the Celtics. Robertson of the Cincinnati Royals. While for the West, they now have the ball. Elton Baylor. Jeff Mullins, Will Chamberlain, Lou Hudson, Joe Caldwell, who now gets it. Baylor. Now they pull away to a five-point lead after trailing by 16. And Elgin Baylor there showed his ability to handle that ball and control the ball while going for the best. He now has 11 points in the ball game. He is a co-winner of the Most Valuable Player Award back in 1959, along with Bob Pettit, who won it several times. Chamberlain fouled on the play. That's his second as Oscar Robertson now goes to the line. Robertson for the East. Chris, nobody in any real foul trouble on the uh, East. Lucas with three, Robertson with three, and Monroe with three. On the West, nobody has more than two. So fouls not seeming to be a factor in the game thus far. Well, Chamberlain committed the foul. In this quarter, the third, he has five rebounds with 6.56 left in the period, 69 to 66. And uh, the red team, or the West All-Stars, decide that they should uh, gather their forces with 6.53 remaining, third quarter. The West is in the lead over the East, 69 to 66. Three Lakers were picked for the All-Star team that year, Baylor, Will Chamberlain, and Jerry West. But West couldn't play because of an injury, and it was Wilt's first season in L.A. after having been traded from the 76ers. The coach was Butch Van Brader, and hired the previous season, and having Elgin Baylor on the team made his job a whole lot easier. Well, I think I've been very fortunate to, to come into a strange league out of college ball and then to have my leader and one of my key players in Elgin Baylor. Uh, Elgin is just uh, absolutely an amazing player. He's probably our best defensive rebounder, uh, putting all things together. Then, once we get on the offense, Elgin is just in the class by himself. Elgin was a new kind of ball player. He was a threat in every part of the game. He's only about 6'5". Nobody ever seen him jumping like that before. When Elgin Baylor came to the Lakers in 1958, he revived the franchise not only on the court, but also at the gate. In fact, the owner of the Lakers at the time said if it hadn't been for Elgin attracting the fans, the team actually might have gone bankrupt. Elgin Baylor was co-MVP of the All-Star Game that season, and ten years later, he was still one of the game's brightest stars. Let's return to the 69 All-Star Game, beginning with a word from the promo department. Wide World of Sports on Saturday afternoon will feature the Champions Track Meet from Los Angeles and also Vince Lombardi, legendary coach and football figure, will analyze the Super Bowl game of last Sunday. All this on ABC's Wide World of Sports Saturday afternoon. Chris in this quarter of the West hitting 6 of 9 for 67 percent. But the East, 1 of 11 for only 9 percent. So the East very cold here in the third period. And with Chamberlain's rebounding. We have Baylor and Caldwell outside. Hudson and Mullins were in the corner. Now Mullins comes back outside, looks for a pass from Caldwell, instead finds Baylor, number 22. Reed, number 19, guarding on the play. And Reed is tacked with a personal. Reed, of course, Chris, a little out of position here. He's been playing center for the Knicks as a result of the recent trade, so he was forced to guard Baylor at forward there and might be a little unaccustomed to playing the forward that he's been playing the center for the Knicks uh, thus far. There are 24 All-Stars here. 23 of the 24 stars in the game have scored thus far. The only guy to be shut out is Hal Greer, last year's most valuable player of the Eastern All-Stars. Well, as Baylor shoots, I'd like to remind you that That's Life, starring Robert Morse and E.J. Uh, Peeker, will be back in this same time period next Tuesday night with guest stars Bill Harris, Agnes Moorhead, and Rodney Dangerfield. So be sure to watch. Willis Reed, NBA All-Star. It's 71 to 68. And there you saw a tactic we might see on the part of the East. Reed at 6'10", taking Baylor at 6'5", inside, and Bill Russell clearing the middle to let him work one-on-one -on -one against Baylor. Oh, beautiful. 
Jeff Mullins of Duke University, a native of Lexington, Kentucky. 6-4. Up and in as it's 73 to 68. Now Robertson. Okay, okay. I hold up. by Mullins. Havlicek picked up by Hudson, number 23. 14. The big O. Chamberlain blocking it, knocking it away. Oscar thought it was a goaltending fraction. However, Baylor has the ball. Caldwell in the corner. Russell on the rebound. Out fighting. Chamberlain. Robertson. Willis Reed. And the native of Louisiana and possibly the best fisherman, although Jerry West may take uh, offense to this, Willis Reed of the Knicks, who gave us a long dissertation about his fishing skills last night, Jack. He sure did at dinner. Uh, we see Wesley Unseld on the sidelines. I think Phil Russell not being able to hit outside. You'll see Wes Unseld come in because he is a pretty good outside shooter. Chris. Jeff Mullins putting it up and in over Hal Greer. Robertson now, 5 of 12 from the field, 42%, 5 of 5 from the foul line, 15 points. Six for six from the line. And Wes Unseld in for the East. The East has to get a little outside shooting from the pivot, so Unseld will try and bring Hayes outside, who is in for Chamberlain now. Now the ball game has been tied up five times. It's 75 all with 358 left in the third quarter. Baylor getting Reed to uh, get out of position and causing a foul. Yes, we have a great matchup in the pivot here with uh, Wesley Unseld and Elvin Hayes, the two top contenders for Rookie of the Year honors in the NBA, playing one another head-to-head. -head. Should be a great battle. Native of Washington, D.C., Elgin Baylor, who became the third player in NBA history to go over the 20,000-point mark earlier this year. Chamberlain and Pettit ahead of him. Now he has 14 points in this All-Star game. Fifteen. So there is a battle going on for top scoring. Robertson and Baylor's. We have 349 left in the third quarter. Wesley Unsell, number 41. Native of Louisville, Kentucky. Here's a native of Indianapolis, Indiana. Giving back to the Kentucky. That was Willis Reed. What a soft left-handed hook. A versatile performer. He's played forward, center for the Knicks. Lenny Wilkins driving through the middle. All game tied for the sixth time. Elgin Baylor is in the lineup for the West along with Jeff Mullins. Hayes and Coaches getting a rest now. Robertson. Timing is perfect. Look at Oscar. He's fired up. He's clapping his hands. He's waving his fist. These players are fired up here, Chris. There's a lot of pride in this game, and as we heard at the luncheon this afternoon, Richie Guerin and Gene Shue both, their teams were higher than a kite. He makes sensational plays look routine. The native of Indianapolis, where his high school team won the Indiana State basketball title, and on to Cincinnati University to win NCAA championships. Wow. Baylor. Oh, oh, oh. All the superlatives for this man, too. Baylor with 17 points. So the battle for the MVP. Monroe. Chamberlain. 101 to 98 with about six minutes left in the ballgame. Mullins. Chamberlain. Havlicek. Oscar Robertson. Earl Monroe. Sloan guarding Monroe. 237 left in the ball game as the East now leads by 10. Caldwell. Robertson. Rebounding to Havlicek. To Monroe. 116 to 104. 218 to go. Now it's Lou Hudson. Baylor. Lou Hudson of the Atlanta Hawks, Elton Baylor of the Los Angeles Lakers. And the East, Chris, here, they started it with that blazing fast break, relying on Bill Russell to get the rebounds, getting it out to Earl Monroe and Oscar Robertson for the fast break baskets. At the end of the first quarter, the East led by 16 points. At halftime, they led by seven. 
At the end of three quarters, they led by three. Uh, then the West went ahead. Elgin Baylor. 11 of 12 tonight from the foul line. Oscar Robertson slowing it up. The quarterback for the East trying to use the time a little bit, setting it up with a good shot. Havlicek. A minute 57. Left in the ball game. The East leading by 12 points. The West, Joe Caldwell. Finding Baylor. Jeff Mullins. And Oscar Robertson. Havlicek. Baylor. To Mullins. To Hudson. Uh, West having trouble finding the hoop. As we have John McLaughlin, Wes Unsell, and Hal Greer coming into the lineup for the East. Oscar Robertson comes out of the ball game. This team leading by 12. The East went on to win the game despite the play of Elgin Baylor, who led the West with 21 points. Elgin was still showing flashes of greatness, but injuries were beginning to catch up to him, and he wasn't quite the player he used to be. The young Elgin Baylor elevated the game with his grace and agility, and he paved the way for Skywalkers of the future. More about that when we come back. You know, until Elgin Baylor came along, basketball was played primarily at ground level. But Elgin took the game airborne. He brought an uncanny ability to float in midair and improvise moves before he came down. And others came along to lift the game even higher. They called Connie Hawkins the Hawk, and never was a nickname more fitting. Hawkins helped take the game above the rim with his swooping flights of fancy to the basket. He first showed his stuff in the old ABA and then soared into the NBA with the Phoenix Suns. And then along came the doctor, Julius Irving, and he also defied gravity with his majestic slam dunks. And who could forget his famous takeoff from the foul line in the 76th ABA dunk contest? No list of high flyers is complete without you know who. He earned his wings in the slam dunk competition and brought the term into vogue. And like Baylor, he had a knack for making up moves in midair. Many players have been called the next Jordan. Maybe the first was Ron Harper, who broke into the league in 1986, but injuries later diminished his leaping ability. Today, there are other players who are taking the game above and beyond. Take uh, Allen Iverson and make him 6'6", 230. Then you have an idea about Elgin, uh, all the stuff that he does at his size, Elgin did at 6'6". Fist card, of course. <laughs> Every time he get the ball, he jumped, he said, okay, am I going to stay in the air for 10 seconds, 20 seconds? One of the most innovative players today would have to be Grant Hill. When he gets up there, not only can, can he throw it down or dunk on you, but he can also be, uh, be creative while up there and uh, you know, adapt to the situation. Well, we've heard from some of the players. Now we'd like to get your take on NBA High Flyers or Elgin Baylor himself. Just drop us an email at NBA.com. Emails are coming in regarding our earlier shows, including the one on Rick Barry, where we talked about free throw shooters. That prompted Randy from California to ask who had the highest free throw percentage in one season. The answer? Calvin Murphy, who shot an incomprehensible 96% in 1981. Glad we could help out, and we'll be back in just a minute. After 14 brilliant seasons, Elgin Baylor retired from the NBA in 1972. He finished with career averages of 27 points, third highest of all time, and 13 rebounds. He was enshrined into the Hall of Fame, and Baylor's number 22 jersey was retired by the Lakers. And while many players have taken the game to new heights, 
Elgin Baylor will always hold a place as basketball's original aerial artist. That's it for this edition of Vintage NBA. I'm Charlie Stock. He wound it up in a blaze of glory, an average career-wise 27 points a game. The third greatest scorer in the history of the game. At only six feet five, the fourth greatest rebounder in the history of the game. Ten times an all-star. Ladies and gentlemen, Captain Elgin Baylor.